from Hollywood, the Hollywood Radio Theater. Starring Ronald Coleman and Benita Hume in the Browning version with Robert Douglas. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Irving Cummings. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. In tonight's play, The Browning Version, we will tell you the story of a man whose devotion to duty cost him his wife and his self-respect until a small boy teaches him to use his heart to understand the people surrounding him. J. Arthur Rank produced this beautiful motion picture which was released here by Universal International. And as our stars, we have Academy Award winner Ronald Coleman and his charming and gracious lady. Benita Hume. Also appearing in this recent stage hit is that fine English actor, Robert Douglas. Now, act one of the Browning version, starring Ronald Coleman as Mr. Crocker Harris and Benita Hume as Millie, with Robert Douglas as Frank. <laughs> In the English countryside, there's a famous school for boys. It's near the end of the term on this late spring morning. And Mr. Frobisher, the headmaster, is showing a new teacher through the beautiful old buildings. It's very decent of you to come down, Gilbert. After all, you had until next term, you know. Pure self-interest, headmaster. Uh, frankly, it terrifies me a little. Taking over the lower fifth, replacing Mr. Crocker Harris. You haven't met him yet, have you? No, sir. I, uh... I understand that he's been ill. It's poor health, you know, that has caused him to resign. He has insisted, however, on being present every day during term. Now then, Gilbert, in this building, you'll find most of our classrooms. That din you hear are Mr. Hunter's scholars in science upper fifth. They uh, seem to be enjoying themselves, then. Huh? Like yourself, Mr. Hunter is a young man. But I trust your devotion to discipline will prove a little more intense than is his. Well... This will be your classroom, the lower fifth. You may open the door, please. Well, boys, it's obvious that Mr. Crocker Harris has not yet arrived. As for Minister Gosser. So prodigious is your predecessor's sense of punctuality that the boys have been known to set their watches by his comings and goings. Isn't that so, boys? Yes, sir. Well, Fortescue, how is your dear mother? Oh, very well, thank you, sir. My name's Wilson, sir. Oh, quite, but your dear mother is well, just the same. Oh, yes, sir. Splendid. Uh, now, boys, this is your new master, Mr. Gilbert. I trust you will be as well behaved with him as you've been with Mr. Crocker Harris. You uh, might like to sit in and watch your future charges in action, eh? Thank you, sir. I'd like to. Uh, Crocker Harris won't mind, I'm sure. If I see him, I'll warn him. Good morning, boys. Oh, good morning, morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning. So Crocker Harris is through, hmm? Sure as fate to recover and be back again next term. So what's the matter with him? Stomach ulcers? Heart. How do you know, Tapo? I go to his own flex to work. I've heard his wife talking. Ho, ho, bosh. What's so funny? The idea of Croc having a heart at all. Do you think he's dying? If you ask me, Croc's dead already. I mean, in a way he is. I don't think he has any feelings at all. But to hate people, you have to have feelings. Oh, Croc doesn't hate people. He can't like them either. And what's more, he doesn't like people to like him. Well, he doesn't have to worry much about that. Oh, I don't know. If he'd give me half a chance, I think I'd quite like him. Are you batty? Well, I'd feel sorry for him. Which amounts to the same thing, doesn't it? Sorry? For the croc? Quiet. Here he is. Sit down, please. Uh, Wilson. Sir? You were late for chapel this morning. I have submitted your name as an absentee. I wasn't really late, sir. Only a few seconds, sir. I was in the library, and you can't hear the bell. Uh, you may recount your excuses to your housemaster, Wilson. I'm not interested in them. <clears throat> Here on my desk are your Latin verses. They are probably the most melancholy accumulation of dissonance I have experienced in all my 18 years with this class. It seems to me, then, that the best way of employing your time would be to attempt the verses again. And if, in the throes of composition... You should find the disturbance from science upper fifth distracting. 
You may, as good classicists, console yourself with the thought that scienta est silare scientiam. <laughs> uh, a tableau. Sir? You laughed at my little epigram. You found it amusing? <laughs> yes, sir. I am startled that you should understand so readily what the rest of the class did not. Well, I... I now, come I, along, Taplow. Tell the others. Don't be so selfish as to keep a good joke to yourself. Uh, I, I didn't hear it properly, sir. Then why, may I ask, did you laugh? Politeness, sir. I am touched. May I go back to my seat now, sir? You may. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Crocker Harris. Uh, oh, forgive me. You, uh, <laughs> uh, you of course, must be my successor, Mr. Gilbert. Yes, I, I am. Uh, Mr. Frobisher said that I might... Yes, he, he told me. Please feel free to occupy yourself in any manner you wish. Thank you. I'm afraid this must be very dull for you. The one the contrary, sir. Uh, extremely informative. Indeed. Well, dear me... One moment, please. You will leave your papers on my desk as usual on your way out. This is, as you know, the last time I shall see you as a class. It might not be amiss for me to say goodbye and to wish you all the best of good fortune. That is all. And of uh, Taplow, I shall expect to see you for extra work at midday precisely. Oh, but I'd fixed up a date for tennis, sir. Uh, then you must unfix it, mustn't you? You must not require me to take money from your father under false pretenses. Twelve noon, Taplow. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Gilbert, perhaps you'd care to glance at their papers before you leave. You might find them, uh, informative. Well, you see, sir, the information I'm looking for hasn't very much to do with Latin verses. Oh, indeed. What has it to do with? Oh, Human nature, I suppose. I see. The modern psychological method. I have no doubt there is much to be said for it. Well, thank you so much for your kindness, sir. And not at all, Mr. Gilbert. Human nature. <laughs> Mr. Hunter, the very man I've been looking for. Good morning, Mrs. Frobisher. Between classes, aren't you? Well, I won't keep you but a moment, Mr. Hunter. The headmaster and I would like so much to have you dine with us tonight. We're having a little farewell for the Crocker Harrises. I'd love to, Mrs. Frobisher. Thank you. I know you're such a friend of theirs. And the headmaster is most anxious to have only their intimate. It hasn't been easy to make up a table, I must say. Oh, well, I didn't mean that unkindly. No, no, I'm quite sure you didn't. She, of course, has quite a few friends. Poor dear. It's rather tragic, isn't it? For her, I mean. So young and quite remarkably pretty, don't you think, Mr. Hunter? Oh, quite remarkably so. Yes. I've wondered so many times why she ever... Uh, well, uh, half past seven, Mr. Hunter. We're having dinner early because of the fireworks. I'll be prompt, Mrs. Frobisher. Goodbye. <laughs> Taplow, isn't it? Yes, Mr. Hunter. What are you doing here? Extra work, sir. Mr. Crocker Harris tutors me. I come here to his house three times a week. Well, where is he? I don't know, sir. He told me to be here at 12. Oh, then uh, is uh, Mrs. Crocker Harris here? No, sir. The door was open. I, I just walked in. I heard any more about your promotion? No, sir. I asked him yesterday. And do you know what he said? He said, my dear Taplow, I have given you exactly what you deserve. No less and certainly no more. Not a bit like him at all. Now read your nice Caesar and be quiet. Caesar? Oh, but this is Greek, sir. Aesculus, the Agamemnon. You sound a little bitter, Taplow. I am. I've fixed up a date for tennis. Then you must unfix it, mustn't you, Taplow? <laughs> That's it, all right, sir. <laughs> Man's barely human. There'll be enough of that. Sorry, but it wasn't just the tennis, Mr. Hunter. Something else, too. Oh? Well, he made one of his little jokes. Of course, no one laughed because no one understood it. But I knew he meant it to be funny. So I laughed. Oh, dear. 
felt sorry for him, having made such a dud. I wish I knew why. Anyway, the joke was something like this. Uh, scientia es something or rather, scientium. Now, you laugh, sir. Hmm? Oh, oh, ha, 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 ha. You laughed at my little epigram, Toplo? You found it amusing? I am startled that you should understand so readily what the rest of... Oh, good Lord. Hello, Frank. Oh, hello. Do you think she heard? If she tells him, there goes my promotion. Nonsense. Catlo? Yes, Mrs. Crocker Harris? Oh, my uh, husband's gone to the bursars. If I were you, I'd go. Oh, but he said most particularly I was to come. Well, why not later then? I'll take the blame. Um, I tell you what, you, you can run an errand for me. Here, take this medicine bottle to the chemist's shop and have him refill the prescription. Here, oh, and here, you might as well slip into Stewart's and have an ice cream. Thanks awfully, ma'am. Goodbye, Mr. Hunter. Cheerio, my boy. Thank you for coming. I didn't know Andrew had made a date. He said he'd be out until lunch. I see. Can you come back for a cocktail this evening? Yes, I'd love to if I may. Do you know I haven't seen you for over a week? Well, I really have been most awfully busy. Besides, we'll see each other in Bradford, won't it's we? Not for over a month. Andrew doesn't start his new job until September 1st. That's one of the things I had to tell you. Oh? I'd expect it to be in London in September. Who with? My family. Oh. Well, surely you can go before then. Well, it'll be difficult. Then you'll have to come to me in August. But Andrew will be there. No, I... I'll manage it in September somehow. It still means I shan't see you for six weeks. You'll survive, all right. Oh, yes. <laughs> I'll survive, but not quite as easily as you will. Oh, Frank, darling, I love you so much. Sometimes I... Oh, Andrew, he's here. Andrew, we have a visitor. Hunter, well, how are you? Very well, thank you. Kind of you to drop in, but I'm expecting a pupil for extra work. Yes, he knows. Ah, good. Taplow is here. I sent you to the chemist to get your medicine. Well, there was no need to do that, my dear. Is, um, uh, is there any refreshment I can offer you, Hunter? Thank you, but I think I'd better be getting along. No, don't. I mean, why not wait until Taplow comes back and we can sit out in the garden and enjoy the sun? Good idea. Uh, oh, Hunter, this may interest you. It's the new timetable I've drafted for next term. Yes, I'd love to see it. I never knew you drafted our timetables. No, didn't you? I've done so for the last ten years. Of course, they are usually issued under the headmaster's signature. Uh, Millie, this might interest you, too. You know it bores me to death. Uh, well, um, anyway, Hunter, by using this table, you can follow your class throughout every day of the week. I must say, I think this is really a wonderful job. It has the merit of clarity, I think. I don't know what they'll do without you. They'll get someone else, I expect. What sort of place is this you're going to endorse it? A school for backward boys. The work will not be arduous, and the doctor seems to think I can undertake it without danger. It's the most rotten bad luck for you. I'm awfully sorry. Oh, my dear Hunter, there's nothing whatever to be sorry for. I'm looking forward to the change. Ah, Taplow. You've been running, I see. There was a queue at the chemist's, I suppose. Yes, Mr. Crocker Harris. And doubtless an even longer one at Stewart's. Yes, sir. Or rather, I... I... late yourself, Andrew. Exactly. And for that, I apologize. Uh, Taplow here is desirous of obtaining his promotion. So he may spend the rest of his career happily mixing explosive chemicals in your science upper fifth. And has he obtained his promotion? He has obtained exactly what he deserves. No less... And certainly no more. I see. Now, come along, Taplow. We'll start with the Agamemnon. Line 1373. How long will he be in there with Taplow? No, oh, half an hour yet. Stop being so jumpy, darling. A garden is supposed to relax one, you know. That's not funny. Millie... How did you ever meet Andrew? I've often wondered. It was out at Windermere, my uncle's place. Andrew was on a walking tour. A walking tour? Andrew? Yeah. He wasn't always the croc, you know. He was quite good-looking in those days, believe it or not. He had a bit of gumption, too. Oh, yes. He was sure he'd end up headmaster of Eton with a knighthood and all that to follow. Well, I can't help but feel sorry for him. He's not sorry for himself. Why should you be? It's me you should be sorry for. I am. Then show me, darling. 
Show me how sorry you are. What are you waiting for, Taplow? Continue the translation, please. Yes, sir. O Clytemestra, we marvel at thy tongue. How bold thou art that you... That you... That thou... Thank you, sir. That thou canst utter such a boastful speech over the bloody corpse of the husband you have just slain. Uh, Taplo, I can only presume you are using a different textbook from mine. <laughs> oh, no, sir. In my text, I can discover no bloody, no corpse, no you have just slain. I just thought it sounded better, sir. More exciting. And she did kill her husband, after all. I am delighted with your interest in dramaturgy, but you are not here to collaborate with Aeschylus. But after all, sir, it is a play. Yes. It's perhaps the greatest play ever written. But I wonder how many boys in the class think that. Ah. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I remember when I was a very young man, I wrote, for my own pleasure, of course, a translation of the Agamemnon. A very free translation. In rhyming couplets. The whole Agamemnon in verse? Oh, that must have been jolly hard work, sir. I derived a great joy from it. The play had so excited and moved me that I wished to communicate some of that emotion to others. I thought it very beautiful. Almost more beautiful than the original. Was it ever published, sir? No. No, I, I didn't finish it. Yesterday, when I was packing my papers, I looked for it, but I'm afraid it is lost. Uh, like so many other things. Oh, hard luck, sir. Uh, <clears throat> yes. <clears throat> now, um, uh, now go back and get that last line right, and I'll be grateful, Taplow, if you'll be kind enough to read without your usual facial contortion. Yes. Millie, I, uh, I really must go now. I, I'm lunching down at the cricket field. Who with? One of my boys and his father. Oh? Not the Carstairs? Why the Carstairs? Betty Carstairs, you think I don't notice? Oh, Millie, please, I detest the woman. Then what were you doing at her box at the concert? The Carstairs invited me. I went because it was a good place to hear from. Yes, much better than the circle. The circle? Oh. It's all right. We gave the seat to someone else. I'm terribly sorry. No, no don't bother to apologize. We couldn't afford a box, you see. It wasn't that. You know it wasn't. I, I, well, I, I clean forgot. Mm, it's funny you didn't forget the Carstairs invitation. Oh, Millie, don't be a fool. Have you ever been in love? I know you're not in love with me, but haven't you ever been in love with anyone? Don't you realize what torture you inflict on someone who loves you when you do a thing like that? I told you I'm sorry. What more can I say? The truth. You had something better to do. Why not admit it? Oh, Millie, for heaven's sake, stop it. Then for heaven's sake, show me some pity. Do you think it's any pleasanter for me to believe that you forgot? Do you think that doesn't hurt either? Oh, right. You'd better go. Oh, uh, if, uh, if I should come down to the cricket this afternoon, is there any chance of seeing you? Well, of course. Well, but your lunch people. No, I'll... No, I'll ditch them. What poison, O oh woman, hast thou... Found. And who? Frank's just going. Oh. Please don't get up. We shall see you again, I trust, before Millie and I depart from your life forever. Oh, yes. I'm stopping by for a drink this evening, and I'll see you at dinner at the Frobishers. Splendid. Oh, uh, we, um, we expected you at the concert, Hunter. I'm most terribly sorry. He clean forgot, Andrew. Indeed. Yeah, not everyone is blessed with your superhuman memory, you see. I really can't apologize enough. Oh, please don't bother to mention it. We managed to sell the seat to a certain Dr. Lambert, who seemed a most agreeable person. You liked him, didn't you, Millie? Yes, very much. I thought him quite charming. Yes, a charming old gentleman. Well, goodbye, my dear fellow. I'll show you out, Frank. Well, Taplow, it would seem our hour has almost expired. Just finish the page. Yes, sir. Frank, just tell me one thing. Well? That you're not running away from me. That's all I want to hear. I'll be at Bradford in September. All right? I think if you're not, I'll kill myself. 
See you later, Millie. You'll hear Act Two of the Browning version in just a few moments. Make a friend and you make an ally. There's a thought for you to keep in mind as many another American has, like Leonard LaRue. On December 22, 1950, Hungnam, Korea was a dying city, and it wouldn't be long before the communist hordes would come down from the hills to wipe out what civilians were left. In the harbor lay an American freighter, the SS Meredith Victory, captained by 37-year-old Leonard LaRue. He was free to pull out any time he wished, but when American army officers asked him to help evacuate some of the natives, he couldn't refuse. Ordinarily, the freighter had room for only 12 passengers in addition to her 46-man crew. Captain LaRue ignored that fact when he told his first mate to start loading Koreans aboard and let him know when the count reached 10,000. But he couldn't stop there. When he finally pulled out for Busan, there were 10,200 people aboard. At Busan, he found the city choked with more than a million refugees, so he had to sail on. It wasn't until December 26th that he landed his passengers at Cujato. Those people will never forget Captain LaRue, and he will never forget the look of gratitude on their faces. He'd prove to himself that by helping others, you help your country. Now our producer, Mr. Cummings. Act two of the Browning version starring Ronald Coleman as Mr. Crocker Harris and Benita Hume as Millie with Robert Douglas as Frank and Dick Beamer as Taplow. It's later the same afternoon. On the playing field adjoining the school are cricket games in progress. Some distance away, Mr. Frobisher, the headmaster, and Mr. Crocker Harris come slowly down the shaded walk. I do hope your dear wife forgives me snatching you away like this. I'm sure I left her in good hands, headmaster. Young hunter, eh? Splendid chap, splendid. You said you had uh, a delicate matter to broach some. Hmm? Oh, <laughs> to be sure. Ah, a convenient bench. Shall we be seated? Uh, the uh, delicate matter is... Uh, well, it, uh, it concerns your pension. You have decided then not to award me a pension? Oh, not I, dear fellow. It's the Board of Governors. With, uh, with utmost regret. Oh, believe me, I presented your case as strongly as I could. Well, thank you. I quite understand. I knew you would, dear fellow. After all, I presume your salary at this other school... My salary will be 200 pounds a year. Well, your wife is quite comfortably situated, is she not? She has 300 pounds a year of her own on which I pay tax. I have nothing. Uh, yes, uh, yes, I see. Uh, of course, there's the uh, school benevolent fund which deals with cases of actual hardship. Oh, there'll be no actual hardship, Headmaster. Oh, good. I'm so glad to hear that. And uh, now, if I may ask a particular favor of you as we stroll back, it uh, concerns tomorrow's prize giving ceremony. You're prepared to say a few words, I hope? Yes, I have my notes with me now, if you'd care to glance at them. That's quite unnecessary. I have implicit trust in your discretion, to say nothing of your delicious wit. Thank you. Uh, uh, no, uh, my favor is simply this. Um, you know, of course, that we are losing two masters, you and uh, young Fletcher. Oh, yes, he is to play rugby for England, isn't he? Yes, a great honor for the school, a great honor. He must be in London on Wednesday to meet Australians. Uh, Fletcher, of course, will uh, also make a speech. Now, since he is considerably junior to you, his speech normally should precede yours. But normally? Oh, well, you know how the boys all feel about Fletcher, dear fellow. <laughs> there might very well be a tremendous demonstration of affection and gratitude. It would be wrong of me to attempt to cut it short. Oh, I dare say that once they start cheering him... Uh, well, uh, you can see my problem. You wish me to make my speech before you come to Fletcher? Uh, believe me, it's more for your sake than mine or Fletcher's. You see, a climax is what one must try to work up to on these occasions. Yes, naturally, I should not wish to provide an anti-climax. Well, now, here we are back at the field again. Uh, the cricket match must be over. Mrs. Crocker Harris, may I say what a delightful hat that is. Oh, thank you, Headmaster. I'm so glad you like it. 
has anyone ever told you what a charming wife you have? Many people, sir. But then I hardly need to be told. <laughs> well, uh, we shall see you at dinner tonight, of course. Thank you. We wouldn't miss it for the world. Splendid. And uh, thank you again, uh, Crocker Harris. Well, do we get the pension? Uh, no. Why not? I don't know. Well, didn't you say anything? I just stood there and made some joke in Latin, I suppose. <laughs> There was very little I wanted to say in any language, Millie. That old phony of a headmaster. Well, I'd have said plenty. What did he expect you to live on? I should be perfectly able to support myself. Yourself? Doesn't the marriage service say something about supporting a wife? Oh, yes, it does. On 200 pounds a year? I shall do my utmost to save some, and you'll be welcome to it. Thank you for precisely nothing. What else did he say? Oh, he asked me to make my speech tomorrow before instead of after, Fletcher. Oh, yes, I know. You know? He wanted my advice about it. I told him to go ahead. I knew you wouldn't care. I... I'll see you at home, Millie. I'm going to my classroom to collect some papers. Very well, Andrew. Go get your papers. <laughs> Gilbert, is that you out there? Come in. I'm sorry, sir. I didn't want to disturb you. Disturb me? After all, this is your classroom now, not mine. Uh, perhaps you'll forgive me if I tear out some old papers. Well, of course. Of course. I, uh, I came here just to have another look. I, I didn't think anyone would be around. I shan't be long. The truth is, I, I've got the most awful attack of jitters. Fifteen and sixteen-year-olds. I'll never be able to handle them. I expect you're laughing at me, aren't you? Uh, why should you expect that? Well, I mean, you're so awfully good at keeping order, aren't you? I, why, I, I'm even told that you're known as the Himmler of the Lower Fifth. Himmler? Oh, yes, the, the Nazi, the Gestapo chief, the, the Himmler of the Lower Fifth. Who told you that? Well, the, uh, the headmaster, among others. I think he exaggerated. I hope he exaggerated. He meant only that you kept the most wonderful discipline. Mm. They're not bad boys, Gilbert. A little wild and unfeeling, perhaps, but not bad. The Himmler of the Lower Fifth. Dear me. I'm afraid I've been terribly tactless, sir. No, 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 no. Of course, from the very beginning, I realized I didn't possess the knack of making myself liked. At the beginning, at least, I did try very hard to communicate to the boys some of my own joy in the great literature of the past. Of course, I failed, as you will fail, 999 times out of a thousand. But a single success, Mr. Gilbert, can more than atone for all the failures in the world. And sometimes, very rarely, it is true, but sometimes I had that success. That, of course, was in the early years Sometimes the boys would laugh at me, and not with me, of course. Never with me, for I have so little sense of humor. Uh, but at, at my little mannerisms and tricks of speech. And that made me very happy. Made you happy? Very happy. Oh, perhaps they didn't like me as a man, but at least they found me funny as a character. And you can teach far more things by laughter than by earnestness. But I... Oh, I fear this is all very personal and embarrassing for you. Well, well, you, you need have no concern about the lower fifths. What I said before hurt you very much. Believe me, I am most desperately sorry. There was no need. I, I should have known for myself. I knew, of course, that the boys for many long years now had ceased to laugh at me, and I didn't know why they no longer found me a joke. Perhaps it was my illness. No. No, I don't think it was that. It was something deeper. Not a sickness of the body, but a sickness of the soul. But to be feared. The Himmler of the Lower Fifth. Well, well, I... I bequeath you this room, Gilbert. I predict you will have great success in it. Thank you, sir. Uh, you... You will, I know, respect the confidence I have just made to you. I should hate you to think that I wouldn't. I really know, don't know what came over me. I, I haven't been very well, you know. Well, goodbye, my dear fellow. And the best of luck, sir, in your new career. Oh, that, yes. Thank you. You brought all this 
stuff back in the classroom. Perhaps you'll tell me how you expect me to pack it all. Oh, most of it can be burned, Millie. And what in the world's this? The Agamemnon rendered into English verse by Andrew. Oh, when did you do that? Before our marriage. It's unfinished. Oh, you're gone long enough. Yes, I was talking with Gilbert. Oh, yes. He's a nice young fellow, isn't he? He looks as though he's got what it takes. Yes. Yeah. I bet when he leaves, it won't be without a pension. It'll be roses, roses all the way, tears, cheers, and goodbye, Mr. Chips. I expect so. I... I... What's the matter? Nothing. Well, you're not going to have another of your attacks, are you? You look no, awful. No, 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 no. I'm perfectly all right. Oh, well, you know best. I'm going upstairs. Your medicine's there if you want it. And uh, don't forget you had a change for dinner. Uh, come in. Oh, Taplow. Well, what... What is it? Oh, nothing, sir. What do you mean by nothing? Well, I... I just came to say goodbye, sir. Oh. And... And to wish you good luck, sir. Oh, thank you. Taplow, that, that's good of you. And I hope you're very... Well? This book, sir. Your translation. You found it, sir. Yes. I found a book, too. I thought it might interest you. Oh, what is it? This one, sir. First translation of the Agamemnon. It's the Browning version. Oh, it's not much good, I'm afraid. Oh, it has its faults, Taplow, but I think you will enjoy it more when you get used to the meter he employs. Oh, but it's for you. It... For me? Yes, sir. I... I've written in it. Did you buy this, Taplow? It was only secondhand, sir. Oh, you shouldn't have spent your pocket money in this way. Oh, that's all right, sir. Oh, the price isn't still inside, is it? Uh, no. No, only what you have written. I in Greek, too, I see. Did I... Did I get the accent wrong? No. Oh, no, no. The Paris Parmenon is perfectly correct. <laughs> Taplow. Would you be good enough to take that medicine you so kindly brought in this morning and pour out one dose in a glass which you will find in the dining room? Yes, sir. Th yes, sir. Thank you. Th th you. You must forgive this little exhibition of weakness, please. One spoonful, it says. I'll be right there, sir. Uh, yeah, the truth is, I've, I've been going through rather a strain lately. Oh, I quite understand. I do, I do. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I'll see who it is. Coming. Coming. Okay, come in, Hunter, come in. Too early, am I? More extra lessons? Uh, no, not a lesson. Taplow very kindly came in to say goodbye. Oh, I'm intruding. Oh, no, no, no. I, I want you to see this book that Taplow has just given me. Robert Browning, the Agamemnon. Yes, uh, w w with an inscription on the flyleaf. Hmm. Oh, I, uh, I never learned Greek. But then we must translate, mustn't we, Taplow? It means that... God from afar looks most graciously upon a gentle master. Well, very pleasant and very apt. Very pleasant, but perhaps not so very apt. Well, well goodbye, sir. Goodbye, Taplow. And thank you very much. Dear me, what a fool I must have made of myself in front of that boy. And in front of you too, Hunter. I, I don't know what you can think of me. Oh, nonsense. I'm not a very emotional person, as you may know, but there was something so really unexpected and touching about his actions. And coming as it did so soon after... Uh, yes. This is a very delightful thing to have, don't you think? You'll treasure it, I know. The quotation. Why, he seemed almost to mean it. Well, I'm sure he does, or he wouldn't have written it. Well, now, uh, now le let, me, let me get you a drink. A glass of sherry? Oh, hello. Andrew, you'll be late. Your husband has just been given a very nice present. Oh, who by? Taplow. He uh, bought it with his own pocket money, Millie. And he wrote a very charming inscription inside. God looks kindly upon a gracious master. No, not gracious. Gentle, I think, yes. Yes, I think gentle would be the better translation. You know, I believe I would rather have had this present than almost anything I can think of. Taplow. <laughs> Why, the artful little beast. Millie. Why artful, Millie? I said, why artful? Because, my dear, only this morning I found Taplow giving an imitation of you to Frank here. Obviously, he was scared stiff, I'd tell you, and that you'd ditch his promotion or something. I see. So, I don't blame him for trying a few shillings worth of appeasement. After all, he's just... 
Andrew, where are you going? My, my medicine, just some more water. Oh, didn't you just take some? Yes. I shouldn't have another if I were you. I, I'm allowed two at a time. Excuse me, Hunter, I must go up and dress. In heaven's name, Millie, how could you? Well, why not? Why should he be allowed his comforting little illusions? I'm not. You're going up there and tell him it was a lie. And if you don't, I will. I shouldn't if I were you. He won't believe you. We'll see about that. He knows what I've told him is the truth. And he'll hate you for your sympathy. He'll think that you're making fun of him. Like Taplow. We're finished, Millie. You and I. Oh, don't be silly, darling. Now sit down and forget all about clever little boys and their five-shilling presents and talk to me. Forget? I'll never forget the glimpse you've just given me of yourself. Oh, now, really? What is this? What have I done? You know what you've done. Now go and look after Andrew. Why all this sudden concern for Andrew? Because I think he's been about as badly hurt as a human being can be. Hurt? You can't hurt Andrew. Why do you hate him so? I don't hate him. You don't hate the dead. You only despise them, and I despise Andrew. What do you mean, he's dead? He's not a man at all. He's a human being, isn't he? And he's sick. If you have any sense of decency, you'll go and see how he is. Decency? Well, you're a fine one to talk about decency when all these months you've been deceiving him. At your urgent invitation. Thank you for slapping me. I deserved it, Millie. And a lot worse, too. Frank, no, no. I didn't mean it. I think you'd better learn the truth, Millie. No, no. I was going to see you in Bradford, yes. But it was going to be for the last time. I was going to tell you so at Bradford. You wouldn't. You've tried it before, but I've always stopped you, and somehow I'll stop you again. No, Millie. Not this time. I would. I would. Because I don't care how much you humiliate me. I can't let you go. And you do want me. You do. It'll be all right at Bradford. You'll see. You'll see. Millie, I am not going to Bradford. You can't leave here. Not now. Not like this. I'm not leaving you, Millie. I'm going upstairs to talk to your husband. Act three of the Browning version in a moment. Make a friend and you make an ally. There's a thought for you to keep in mind, as many another American has. A group of people in Seattle, Washington, thought about it and did something about it. The owners of a large knitting mill there discovered that they had an overstock of yarns and pieces of material which they couldn't use. Well, day after day, they heard on their radios and read in the newspapers how badly Koreans needed warm clothing to survive the freezing winter. So they decided to do something about it. They got together with their employees and worked out a plan. Although the factory ordinarily closed at 4 p.m., the employees volunteered to work overtime without pay several evenings a week to make up the excess material and yarn into sweaters, especially small ones for children. The result? Within a short time, 150 sweaters plus other gifts from the workers at the mill were on their way via the Marine Air Force to be distributed to the Koreans who need them the most. Those Seattle folks have found great satisfaction in their unselfish work, and they've discovered that by helping others, you help your country. We pause now for station identification. Curtain Rises on Act Three of the Browning Version, starring Ronald Coleman as Mr. Crocker Harris and Benita Hume as Millie, with Robert Douglas as Frank and Dick Beamer as Taplow. Frank Hunter has gone upstairs. He hesitates in the hallway for a moment, then knocks on a closed door. What is it, Hunter? About Taplow. Come in. Well, he was imitating you. But I'm to blame, and I'm very sorry. Was it a good imitation? No. I expect it was. Boys are often very clever mimics. I don't suppose you'll believe this, but he told me he liked you very much. So you see, 
I don't think it was appeasement. That book, I mean. The book? Dear me, what a lot of fuss about a little book. If I were you, I'd keep the book just the same. You may find it means something to you after all. Exactly. It'll provide me with a perpetual reminder of the scene with which, at this very moment, Taplow probably is regaling his friends. I say, chaps, I gave the croc a book to buy him off, and he cried. I was there. I saw him cry. My mimicry is not quite as good as his, I fear. Forgive me. Listen to me. Let me give you one last piece of advice. I will be glad to listen. Leave your wife. So that you may the more easily carry on your intrigues with her? How long have you known about it? Since it began. How did you find out? I was told by someone whose word I scarcely could discredit. Oh, no. Well, that's... that's horrible. Is it? Or is it simply a question of facing facts? But she may have told you a lie. She never tells me a lie. She's out to kill you. Powdered glass, you mean? Something of that nature? No. Something deadlier than poisoning the body. The soul? Oh, yes, in that other sense, she is, as you, as you rightly say, out to kill me. That is only another fact that I have managed to face, just as I have faced the more important fact that she succeeded in her purpose long ago. And now, Hunter, if you will allow me to finish dressing, we're expected at the Frobisher. <laughs> So it is my melancholy duty, ladies and gentlemen, to propose a toast of farewell and Godspeed to our friends, the Crocker Harrises, and to wish them all success and continued happiness in their future life together. Thank you, Ted Martha, thank you. Well, ladies, shall we have coffee in the other room? We leave the gentlemen to their cigars and improprieties. Uh, cigars, yes. Uh, the improprieties we leave to the ladies. <laughs> Well, don't be long, dear. The fireworks, you know. I understand the display will be simply thrilling. Time for a quick game of billiards, Williamson. Come along, Carstairs. You can mark for us. Andrew, if I may talk to you for just one moment. Again, Hunter? Please, we can slip outside. I want you to believe that I am more ashamed for what has happened than I've ever been in my life before. I had hoped we were finished with all that. When I told you to leave your wife, it had nothing whatever to do with me. Whatever she chooses to do... I have decided never to see her again. That hardly seems a very chivalrous decision, Hunter. Nor does the course you urge on me. For heaven's sake, forget chivalry. It's your only chance. You must leave her. And add another grave wrong to the one I have already done her? What wrong? I married her. You see, she's really quite as much to be pitied as I. We're both of us interesting subjects for your microscope. Both of us needing something from the other to make life supportable. Yet neither of us able to give it. Two kinds of love, hers and mine. Worlds apart, as I know. Though when I married her, I didn't think that they were in incompatible. Nor, I suppose, did she. Well, the unhappy fact remains that the love we should have borne each other has turned into a bitter hatred. And that's all the problem is, the unsatisfied wife and the henpecked husband. Not half so tragic as you might think. It is usually, I believe, a subject for farce. Andrew, is that you? I've been sent to get you all out of the garden. Now, where are the others? In the billiard room. Well, do go, won't you, Frank? Mrs. Robes is waiting. Look, don't leave when she does tomorrow. Stay here until you go to your new job. When will you realize that I am not interested in your advice? All right, do as you think best. But I'd like to be of some help. Hunter, if you think by this expression of kindness you will get me to repeat that shameful exhibition of emotion I made in front of Taplow, I can assure you, you have no chance. My hysteria over that book was no more than a sort of reflex action of the spirit, the muscular twitchings of a corpse. It cannot happen again. A corpse can be revived. I don't believe in miracles. Don't you? Funnily enough, even as a scientist, I do. Your faith would be touching if I were capable of being touched by it. I think you are. I'd like to visit you in your new school. Oh, it's an absurd idea. Your term starts September the 1st, right? I think I might manage it about the 12th. How would that be? I tell you, it's childish. You'd be bored to death, and probably so would I. We'll say Monday the 12th, then, shall we? Uh, say whatever you like, only leave me alone, please. The 12th. You'll remember that. I suppose I'm at least as likely to remember it as you are. As for now, I shall go and look at the fireworks. Another display of disintegration. 
Andrew, wait. I've been listening to you and Frank. Have you, Millie? And I must say it's a laugh. You inviting him to stay with you. Uh, you couldn't have heard very clearly. The suggestion was entirely his own. Frank is coming to Bradford. Yes, I remember you telling me so. He's coming to Bradford. What is still more likely, he is not going to visit either of us. He'll be with me. In any event, Millie, I will not. What? I am not going away with you tomorrow. I'm going to stay here until I take up my new post. Oh, are you? What makes you think I'll join you later? I don't. You needn't expect me. I don't think that either of us has any longer the right to expect anything further from the other. And now, my dear, let us view the Roman candle. Hello? Hello? As I told you before, I want to speak with Mr. Hunter. But he can't have gone yet. Did you give him my message? I... Oh, I see. Thank you. Good morning, Mrs. Crocker Harris. And I'm sorry... What is it, Taflo? I ran into the garden. Mr. Hunter was most anxious that you should have this letter before you leave. Well, thank you. I, uh, I suppose Mr. Crocker Harris has left the ceremonies. What? Oh, uh, yes, yes, he just walked out. I'd better dash or I'll be late. Bye, Mrs. Crocker Harris. Frank. <laughs> oh, Frank. No. Dear Crocker Harris, to, to come to me now on the speaker's platform. Why, I was just about to start the progress. Yes, yes, I, I know, Headmaster. But yesterday you agreed. You promised me that I you... have changed my mind. I shall make my speech after Fletcher instead of before, as is my privilege. After Fletcher? Oh, but, but I told you about the need for working up to a climax. Besides Fletcher... Yes, yes, I'm sure he is. But you see, I am now of the opinion that occasionally an anticlimax can be surprisingly effective. Oh, this is lamentable. You leave me no choice. No, I don't, do I? Uh, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, scholars, <clears throat> before I call upon General Lord Baxter of Ethiopia, who will award our prizes, it is my sad duty to listen with you to a few words of farewell from two masters who are leaving us. First, I shall call upon... Upon Mr. Fletcher. But, but I thought that I... Mr. Was... Arthur L. D. Fletcher. <laughs> uh, well, chaps, I can tell you that I shall feel much less nervous tomorrow facing the Australians than I am on this platform now. So, um, uh, just let me say what I have to say in a single sentence, and then let me relax and enjoy myself listening with you to Mr. Crocker Harris's... Uh, gilded and classical epigrams. Goodbye, good luck, and uh, let's win the public school sports again next year. And now, Mr. Crocker Harris. Uh, thank you, Headmaster. <clears throat> A valedictory address, as those of you who have read your Plato's Apology will remember, can be of inordinate lengths. But I, unhappily, am not Socrates. And, as I have always believed that schoolmasters... As I have always believed that... that I... You must excuse me, please. I had prepared a speech, but I find now that I... I have nothing to say. Or rather, I have three very small words, but they are most deeply felt. They are these. I'm sorry. I'm sorry because I have failed you in what you have the right to demand of me as your teacher. Sympathy, encouragement, and humanity. I'm sorry because I have deserved the nickname of Himmler. And because by so doing, I have degraded the noblest calling that a man can follow, the care and molding of the young. I claim no excuses. I can only hope that you and the countless others who have gone before will find it in your hearts to forgive me for having let you down. 
I shall not find it so easy to forgive myself. That's all. Goodbye. Giving, but I couldn't find you. I'm afraid I was rude, Taplow. I, I walked off the platform, nor did I stop walking until I was here at home. I was here this morning, Mr. Crocker Harris. You were? Yes, sir. And then as I was leaving, I found this in the wastebasket. Your Agamemnon, sir. Oh, you should have left it there. But I didn't. I was interested. And I read it, and I think it's rather good. Do you, Taplow? Well, it's a jolly sight better than that old Brownie's anyway. Uh, you must not be disrespectful of one of England's greatest poets. Uh, you, you, you don't think it's bad, eh? Well, do, do you know, sir, I found it quite exciting. It's like a play. I mean a real play. I mean a modern play. I read it all through. It's a pity it's not finished. Do you think so, Taplow? Why did you chuck it out, sir? Oh, it hardly seemed worth finishing. Oh, but it is. It really is. Well, goodbye again, sir. And by the way, as long as it is too late now to alter anything, have I got my promotion? Uh, well, that, that... That is a highly irregular request, Taplow. That information will be duly forwarded to your parents by the headmaster. Yes, sir. Just thought I'd ask. Oh, well, good luck. Good luck to you, Taplow. Uh, and... And Taplow... Sir... If you have any regard for me, you will refrain from blowing yourself into little bits when you start your next term in science upper fifth. Oh, thank you, sir. Thanks, sir. In a moment, our stars will return. At the time when the city of Berlin was blockaded and American Air Force planes were making regular airlifts into the city, Lieutenant Gail Halverson got an extra special idea. He tied his handkerchief to some candy and chewing gum and dropped the uh, candy chute from his plane. Well, this was the beginning of Operation Little Vittles. And soon from the aircraft of Lieutenant Halverson and his buddies, thousands of candy chutes dropped every day to the German children around Tempelhof Air Force Base. Americans at home heard of the project and sent handkerchiefs to make the tiny parachutes. To the desperate blockaded city, it was a symbol of kindness, of generosity, and of hope for the future. Such acts by you and your friends today are shaping our world of tomorrow. Now, Mr. Cummings with our star. And here they are, two of the most charming people in Hollywood, Ronald Coleman and Benita Hughes. But I must say I was surprised at you, Benita. We introduced you as lovely and gracious. And, well, you you were just weren't no lady. <laughs> well, I must admit, it wasn't my usual character. <laughs> yeah, but once in a while, we women like to be wicked. <laughs> I assure you, this is no indication of our life at home. We, 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 we really get on very well, don't we, Benita? Oh, beautifully, darling. Yes. And you'll still love me when I'm old and grey, won't you? <laughs> well, I do, darling. I do. <laughs> Thank you, my love. Now I want to tell you about next week's play. It's the thrilling drama of a man and a woman whose love is overshadowed by a haunting figure from the past. metro goldwyn Mayer's screen success, Undercurrent. And as our stars, lovely Joan Fontaine. And that accomplished actor... Mel Ferrer. Yes, I remember it was an exciting picture. Well, good night. Good night. Good night. Hollywood Radio Theater is a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.